So we're going to talk about collective action partnerships and how companies are navigating this. And, you know, we've been talking about partnerships for a long, long time in this field. But what's interesting is, is how many different ways they've morphed and, and grown and changed. And so what we hope to do in the next uh, 20 minutes is really to talk about some of these examples with these three leadership companies. Um, starting down at this end, Elizabeth Brinton is the Corporate Vice President of Sustainability at Microsoft. And I also want to acknowledge that we were raising hands before that Elizabeth was actually at the very first Green Biz event when she was at PGE, and we were it was our event was hosted at PGE headquarters in San Francisco. So kudos to you for still sticking with us for 15 years. Um, in the middle, Michael Kabori, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Starbucks. And Vien Trong uh, runs a senior, is a senior director of engagement, global sustainability at Nike. And why we're not having this conversation in Seattle is beyond me. <laughs> I just don't know. But but um, let's let's talk about some of the ways that partnerships happen. And and one of the things I want to start with you, Michael. For years, when I'd hear about companies doing leadership things, I'd often say, "Well, what drove that?" And often the answer were two things: Walmart and Greenpeace. <laughs> And okay. you, you've got an interesting partnership that you're engaged with, uh, a large partnership, I think, involving a Greenpeace and hazardous chemicals. Talk a little bit about it. Sure. Well, Joel, you know, as I was reflecting, I mean, you, you and I have been doing this for 25 years, right? And uh, Well, longer, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't count. We don't count. It's our secret. <laughs> I think I've been engaged in like 15 of these industry collaborations, and you know most of them. And the, the one you're asking about is when I was at Levi Strauss and Company leading sustainability there. It started in 2010 when our friends at Greenpeace decided to launch a campaign on footwear and apparel companies. Uh, they they um, called it the detox campaign to have us eliminate hazardous chemicals in our supply chains. And so that prompted the industry to get together we were doing these things independently, but they really got us to get together. Nike was one of the key players, Levi's, Adidas. We got together and we developed a, something called a manu, uh, manufacturing restricted substances list. We did our research. We did our homework. We got our suppliers involved. Lo and behold, 10 years later, after giving annual progress reports to Greenpeace, 10 years later, the industry has moved forward pretty much eliminated hazardous chemicals. 80 companies have joined the initiative now. It's a going concern. And don't believe me, believe Greenpeace, because they are publicly saying this has made significant progress, one of the most successful initiatives that they've ever engaged in. So so it's interesting there just in terms of what I generally don't hear uh, activist groups saying is 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 thank you now do more, but it's never the thank you, they're never the acknowledgement. Um, are you saying that they're sort of off your case now or they're, are they still on your case and saying, wait, that's not enough, keep going further, faster? Well, I'm no longer in the apparel industry, so I'm at Starbucks now, but what I can say is, I mean, you can look it up, you can go online and check it out. I mean, if you search, Greenpeace is acknowledging the apparel industry made great strides in eliminating hazardous chemicals. So what does that do for you internally to have uh, Greenpeace actually acknowledge and 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 uh, in fact celebrate what you're doing? Does that buy you anything? Well, certainly it's huge cre credibility with customer. It's huge credibility with suppliers and for the company. Yes, I mean it. It it demonstrates for all the companies involved. I mean, then mm -hmm. you can talk about Nike, but you know, for all the companies involved, I mean, huge progress made in achieving the impact that we all wanted yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. So again, um, uh, Nike, through your leadership, is is leaning into envir uh, environmental justice issues at the community level. Talk a little about, first of all, how that came about and, and what you're actually doing and who's involved. Yeah, happy to. Well, I, I want to start with saying thank you first, um, because I, over the last couple of days, I have just met incredible folks in the audience, NGOs, consultants, researchers, advocates, uh, tech-based consumer goods, and I've learned a lot. And for me, I think the ongoing work that we have to do is how do we continue to accelerate this 
work. And I think collective action is absolutely necessary in order for us to move forward. One of the things for me that's been a passion project is how do we continue to do so and make sure that we're thinking about folks who are not necessarily in this room, underserved communities and communities of color that have really been hit first and worst by climate change. What we know across the board is that oftentimes the historic redlining issues, the social inequality issues have left some communities behind. Not only that, they're often the last to receive relief. And so one of the things that we've done in Nike is to think about as we work across the board with our 79,000 employees and how we make, move, uh, return products and then transform it all over again. How do we actually work across different functions? And one of the projects we have launched with our social and community impact team, which leads our charitable efforts, is to look at how do we begin to break down some of the silos of our work? How do we find ways to collaborate to address the issues of inclusivity and resiliency in communities? So together we have launched a community climate resiliency program, which looks at doing exactly that helping to increase the resiliency and inclusivity in the communities in which we want to serve. And we have launched this program in partnership with the Trust for Public Land, uh, working in New York, Chicago, and LA to help support the communities, not only through the work that we have talked about earlier, but also making sure that they're engaging in play and fun and sport and wellness. You know, let's not forget that it's absolutely crucial. Um, so I encourage everybody to uh, actually learn more about it by coming to our program later this afternoon at 1.30. Uh, our, our teams will be there. And by the way, one of the things that we say at Nike is get off the sidelines, get into the action, make sure that we're not just looking at what's happening, but be a part of the solution making. And so this event will, uh, at 1.30, will engage folks at tables across the board so we can exchange ideas and continue the conversation on collective action. So I, 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 I'll acknowledge that I sort of hate the question, what's the business case, as if there's a business case for destroying the environment and, and, and depleting communities. But is this a business activity or is this philanthropy or what does this do, if anything, for Nike? Well, if there's no planet, there's no sport, and there's no way for us to engage sports uh, with kids, right? And so for us, it's deeply integral, which is why it makes me so happy and proud to be at the company, because it allows for us to look at how do we continue to engage kids, right? And not only is it, you know, good for the business case, but it's also about how do we look at that across the, across the board in playgrounds and schools and continue to, you know, look at the future for our athletes. Let me just say one more thing. When I say athletes, we say everybody in here is an athlete because if you have a body, you're an athlete. So we want to make sure that we create access for everybody to engage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some days feel more athletic than others, but that's <laughs> another We'll get you the right shoes for it. <laughs> All right. Swoosh. There it is. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> So, so Elizabeth, I know there's a business case be, uh, at Microsoft for, for the uh, partnerships you're doing with startups because you are your 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 role at, at Microsoft is specifically to create new business opportunities. Talk a little bit about how you're partnering with startups and and just what's that all about. Well, it's really exciting because if you think about the age of urgency and how we actually collectively do more. You, we're a platform company, so our job is to create the software that can enable these new business models of the future around physical technologies and other things that actually can solve the climate problems. And so we're looking at, for example, the application of software to help solve energy efficiency. So a great example, this is a cool startup out of Australia. It's called Willow, and they have built a really super granular digital twin technology for advanced energy efficiency on top of the Microsoft Azure and sustainability stack. And then what we're doing for that, they're, they've raised venture capital like a typical startup. And so what we do is we can go together and do a sell with motion in partnership and that that helps them scale so much faster. And then for us as Microsoft, and we measure, and so we that has actually shortened our sales cycle by six months around really complicated discussions with customers around energy efficiency as an example. So when you put the two things together, together we can do more and you're accelerating and you're building this commercial velocity. And let every one of us, these are, we're publicly listed companies. We have to deliver shareholder value. So to me, what's so exciting 
thinking about 15 years ago when I was at the first Green Biz doing a keynote, there was a small group of us with Kermit the Frog, right? <laughs> and, and now look at us, it's a movement. And so we're creating velocity in the movement that demonstrates and proves that you can do well by doing good. And that's really exciting. So you're investing in these startups and you're helping and, 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 you're, and then you're going with them to customers. So you're- You're, uh, you're creating a commercial ecosystem. Yeah. And the commercial ecosystem is then aligned with, again, meeting that, helping our customers with science-based targets, helping them meet their sustainability objectives. So really it's about everything coming together. So um, it's about, the, you asked about philanthropy, it's about the philanthropic arm all of our companies have. Mm -hmm. It's about the commercial arm. And then it's extending those partnerships with NGOs and with startups and with other large scale commercial and, you know, uh, partners and customers so that we can together get that flywheel of momentum so it speeds up. Yeah. So collaboration partnerships, easy to say, really hard to do. And a lot of the conversations I hear on this topic are, you know, how did you, what did you learn about partnering with NGOs or, or startups? So I want to talk about the internal processes that it takes to get to some of these things. And I'll start with you, Elizabeth, on this. What, what have you learned about what it takes internally who to get the buy-in, to get the momentum, to get, create the flywheel? Well, as building businesses for a long time, one of the things I've, I'll start with a corporate setting like Microsoft, is it's building a coalition. For example, one of the things I did when I got there, we have a, a community of employees. We have over 9,000 employees. We use Teams and Viva, and, and that those are all volunteers. They all have other day jobs. And so I was like, I crowdsourced with my colleagues all over the world, and I'm like, okay, what are you seeing in your market? What technology should we most urgently apply that's gonna meet a need of a customer? And so that huge crowdsourcing of building that momentum and spirit, and then it's, so it's building the collaborative framework and then a very specific governance so that you can, again, get your time to market, make the decisions around your product. And so it is building community hmm. inside to then, and then you have to show the business case. So it's being incredibly pragmatic, partnering with finance and really showing how the math is going to work. Uh, obviously you, you, you bring, have to bring in finance because you're making investments and who else, uh, just give us a flavor of who else is involved here. Well, so in a Microsoft context, it is product marketing, it is engineering, it is finance, it is our commercial MCAP sales organization. It's our partnering organization. It is legal on contracting and so forth. I mean, it's pretty much everybody. And so the key bit of wisdom to pass along is a key skill set, learn how to really collaborate. Mm. And what that means is you have to be on the one hand, a passionate, annoying person <laughs> to drive change. And at the same time, you, you have to have so much resiliency because you have to be the one that wakes up every day. We were talking about this every day, being like on it, passionate. And so a no is never a no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vianne, um, what have you learned about internally making this kind of change happen, particularly because, uh, I mean, uh, uh, communities are, are both your market and, and they're also an opportunity, as you're saying. So what have you learned about that? Um, involved. I've learned to continue to be dogged and determined for sure, uh, continue to stay passionate about this issue. But more than that, what I've learned is there's a number of others inside of the company who care deeply as well. And some who really care deeply, but want to learn even more. So what we have learned to do is we brought in leaders to help speak to our employee resource groups, to really bring people who are interested, but not yet sure how to engage. And so for instance, we brought in African-American leaders to our black employee resource group. We brought in Latin ex-leaders from different NGOs across the board, uh, leaders who are um, uh, LGBTQ, Latinx, uh, women, Asian descent, and coming into employee resource groups to say, what is climate change doing to our communities? Mm -hmm. How do we better understand it? And how do we continue to amplify and collaborate with them uh, as we move forward? And actually, it has been hugely encouraging how excited employee resource groups have been and continue to invest in these organizations. On top of that, we have the benefit of having leaders who care deeply about these issues, including our CEO, who came in with this as being one of his top priorities. So that really helps unlock solutions across the board. And truly, I think what Elizabeth said is, is right. We have to make sure that we have the ability to work across the board with leaders who are just passionate about this issue and find solutions across the board. That's where innovation really continues. Yeah, so I'll same question to you, Michael. Who's What does it take at Starbucks to have these kinds of partnerships with Greenpeace and, and a number of, and, and how many companies are involved with this uh, ZDHC? 
um, uh, well, zero, dis zero discharge. So that wasn't chemicals. Starbucks. That was Levi's, and it was about 80 companies in the apparel sector. Uh, you know, I would say for, for Starbucks, as we explore partnerships, and one of the partnerships that um, I'm very excited about these days at Starbucks is um, something called the Water Resilience Coalition. Oh, yes, right. I'm... That we're part of, that Microsoft is a part of. It's 25 CEOs of big companies, us, Microsoft, AB InBev, Cargill, Ecolab. It's the CEO level that is coming together. The long-term goal is is net positive water. Mm -hmm. But the shorter term goal, 2030 goal, is that we are investing in 100 threatened water basins all around the world. Hmm. 100 threatened water basins around the world. Yeah. And the great thing about it, Joel, is we've gotten our teams involved and we're doing a project with Nature Conservancy in China. So our China team is very involved in water, um, it's watershed restoration and a big watershed, big lake in China, Qingdao, Qingdao Lake in China, one of the biggest freshwater lakes in China. And we're doing sustainable ag, mm. better farming practices. We're doing wetland restoration. And the local team is engaged and involved. We have these other big companies involved with TNC. And I think, Joel, to me, this is the future because we're talking about the watershed. So it's not a single issue anymore. Yes, it's based on water, it is a, but we're looking at is, land use practices. We're looking at biodiversity. We're looking at environmental pollution. Equity issues. Right? All of these things in the watershed. And it's not just us, right? It's all these companies outside of our own four walls contributing to the landscape, yeah. the what us old school guys would call the ecosystem. Right? And this <laughs> is where I still call this it. This is too. where it's headed. <laughs> and I know a lot of right WS, WBCSD is working on these yeah. kinds of landscape issues yeah. as well. So we've just got about a minute left for each of you. And I want to ask yeah. you a tough question to see if you can just give me like some of these things take a long time to manifest and to be successful. How do you know? And I'm going to start with you, Vian, that something is working as opposed to eh, let's move on to something else. What is, what at what point do you get that? I think for us, what we have committed to doing is continue to do this work for the long haul. It's why we have developed partnerships with our suppliers over 30 to 40 years. We have been doing this work in sustainability for decades, yeah. and we continue to do so moving forward. And so for us, what I would encourage us to do is not actually make a determinant determination that is not working too soon. Because for us to advance sustainability, we have to do that across the board with many different stakeholders and really invest in these partnerships for the long haul. Yeah. Patience, Michael, is that your uh, advice or making these things work? I'll quote one of my favorite entertainers, Elvis Presley. <laughs> okay. A this... little less conversation, a little more action. <laughs> All right, all right. Yeah. And, and 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 picking up on on action, what I would say is this is where partnerships are really important is because success in a business context changes and owner who is the best owner for a business? What's the best stage changes. And so that's okay. And so recognizing giving yourself permission to change the ownership of an asset to exit a company, to spin out a company, to scale a business. These are all normal life cycle stages. And then when you understand that and you have an ecosystem approach, you can actually see success at each stage. Yeah. I mean, there's so many pieces that go into these things and so much patience, determination, ecosystem, building, relationship, maintenance, uh, and, and again, patience because these things do take time. But I think this has been really helpful to, to get a flavor of all the different possibilities and to see what and how leadership companies like Nike, Starbucks, and Microsoft are moving this forward. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you.